Welcome to Plane Talk, and you know what I haven't, I, I actually feel remiss. There have been so much going on. We have this red-hot five-way race in the United States House of Representatives primary for the Republican Party. We've had a gubernatorial race that has been ugly at times. We have our current governor who is trying to be the vice president of the United States. I have not written enough about the legislative races here in North Dakota, and we have not talked enough about the legislative races here in North Dakota. But there are some very things happening, very important things, very consequential, very meaningful things happening in some of these Republican primaries. In a lot of ways, it's it's the battlefield for control of the North Dakota Republican Party. I don't know if my guest, uh, Jeremy Olson, he's an incumbent state representative from District 26, uh, is going to agree with that or not. But he does have an interesting story to tell about you know the way some of these campaigns are playing out. Joining me uh, today, sitting in for Chad Oban, who I'm I'm pretty sure is taking another vacation now. I don't know. He's probably out watching baseball somewhere while the rest of us work. Um, that's just how that works, I, I guess. I don't know. I wish I had his schedule. Uh, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm, I'm being really mean to Chad, but I get to be because he's not here to defend himself. Um, ben, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Rob. How are you? I'm thanks doing... for coming on, Jeremy. Yeah, thanks for coming on, Jeremy. Uh, are you, uh, you're running in District 26. And you are uh, running, there's a, um, uh, another incumbent, uh, Senator Dale Patton, is also uh, running for re-election. Uh, and then there's also a, um, well, I, I guess all three of the incumbents are running, I should say. That's that's ground. Wow. But there is a challenger, a newcomer, uh, who is also running. And, and there's been some confusion. Now, people who are familiar with this podcast in my writing are familiar with Representative Brandon Pritchard. Um, but in addition to being a Republican state representative, he is also the executive director of a group called Citizens Alliance for North Dakota. Um, and this group is dedicated to targeting certain Republican incumbents and trying to defeat them. And that is a, an extremely unusual situation where you have a sitting lawmaker who is also the director of an activist group that is trying to unseat sitting lawmakers from his own party. So that's going on. And then what we're here, what we have Representative Olson on to talk about is a, a situation where some of the, the flyers that are being sent around in, in Representative Olson's race as well as another race in Mandan and, and maybe others across the state, I guess I don't know, um, that have been underhanded and, and a little duplicitous. Representative Olson, thanks for coming on. Hey, Rob. Hey, Ben. Thanks uh, for having me on here. It's a pleasure to be on here. Appreciate you coming on. And I, Rob, real quick, uh, could, Jeremy, could you kind of describe your district to folks? Because you're sort of a new district on the scene out there in western North Dakota. Yes, uh, District 26 is a new district out here. After the uh, census, they did the redistricting, and we were part of the old 39, which basically went from the Missouri River to the South Dakota line. Uh, 26 is McKenzie County and probably about the north three quarters of Dunn County, minus the Fort Berthold Reservation. So smack dab in the middle of oil com- country is is District 26. Yeah, Wat- Watford City, I think the largest city in your district. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, the main the main sounds is be, would be Watford City and and Kildare and Halliday. Those those uh, Alexander. Those are the ones that are you know the main towns in our area. I'm from Arnegard, uh, just a, a little small town between Watford and Ale- and Watford and Williston. So uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on in your district. Some flyers that came out recently. So um, early this week, uh, there was a mailer that came out. Uh, they had a uh, it had pictures of uh, Senator Dale Patton, uh, Kelby Timmons, and Roger Mackey on it. The uh, interesting part about that is one, a picture of Dale Patton was pretty old. I mean, he still had uh, brown in his beard, so it, <laughs> it, 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 it had to be dug up from somewhere. Well, he's but, probably uh, he's probably not complaining about that part. Time gets us all. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other part of it was it was absolutely false. Uh, Dale Patton and I are running together. He and I are our colleagues. We are aligned on a lot of things. We're both uh he's a senator and I'm a rep, but we're both on our respective finance and tax as well as the energy committees. And we do a lot of solid, uh tangible results for our district and, and for the Western counties. And for them to use Dale Pat Senator Patton's image without his permission, without his knowledge. And send it out in mailers like that was absolutely underhanded and, and um, unethical, um, and, and that's what happened. 
Did you have any contact with Representative Pritchard? Did he or his group express to you that they were going to do this before these mailers came out, or was it just a surprise in the mailbox? None at all. No, no, uh, no inkling at all. Um, and same thing with Senator Patton. He he uh, texted Pritchard, asked him to call him, and he wouldn't. You know, he wouldn't respond. So, you know, unfortunately, that is kind of been the mo of uh, of. Uh, uh, Representative Pritchard uh, been very uh, unprofessional in his uh, ways of dealing with things. I uh, I, I should note that because I, I wrote about this um, this story this week, and then also I I attempted to to get a comment from Representative Pritchard as well. I texted him, I called him. Uh, his voicemail box was full when I called. Couldn't leave a message. I certainly sent him a text as well, and uh, got no response at all, which I I thought was unfortunate. Um, to, to be clear, I mean, the, the way Citizens Alliance came about for people listening is, uh, or, or at least just judging by public filings and stuff, the, the, uh, thread that I fall, fall, uh, followed is originally Pritchard had a, uh, a, a, ind- a federal independent political action committee called the YR Victory Fund, Young Republicans Victory Fund. And he went around and he raised a bunch of money. And I, I spoke with some of the people he raised money from, and they said that they were told that the money would go towards uh, promoting engagement uh, among young Republicans, getting young people basically involved in in politics and, and everything else. They thought that was a, a good cause. And I mean, taking it at face value, I think that's a good cause. Um, but what happened is, is, is at the end of the reporting period, at the end of the year last year, um, Representative Pritchard took all just about all of the money, except for I think a ten thousand dollar payment to himself. Uh, took almost all the money and put it into a different political action committee called the Citizens Citizens Alliance, which in turn is now being used to attack incumbent Republicans. And and Citizens Alliance is also a national group. They're based out of Ohio. Um, you know they operate in a lot of different places. And and this group also you know, sent out a, and I, I guess this is my question now for you, Representative Olson. They had also sent out a, uh, like a questionnaire or a lawyer, maybe it's like an oath or something or like a, something like that, asking lawmakers to, to sign on, you know, to support their, their groups, um, whatever their, their, their group's agenda. Did you get that? I mean, did, did they ask you to sign on to that or to sign an oath or something like that? To be honest, I don't recall getting it. I'm, and if I did, I would have thrown it out because I know, one, I'm not going to sign any pledges with anybody for anything because what is that going to do? I'm not going to paint myself in a corner on something that I might not know anything about. And that and what happens if they? Oh, now we're now we're changing the narrative. And oh, you you made a you made a pledge to us, even though I you know it might have been for something else. I don't play that game. You know what? I'm going to run on my accomplishments. I'm not going to have you know somebody try to bully me or or twist my arm into doing something for them and being part of a uh, a group think i'll i'll uh you know i'm i'm busting my butt all my life to you know to, to get educated and do well and be a good leader and and to be a good legislator and like i said i don't have the time to waste on that kind of uh, nonsense good for you i try and avoid that much commentary while interviewing but i can't help myself need more of that Representative Olson, can I ask, at the district convention with the Republican Party in 26, or just in general, Arnie Garden, small town, Wapper City's on the grow, but it's still a small town. When you're at the grocery store, at the ball game, at church, do you have folks coming up to you saying, who know you, saying, Jeremy, you know, we like you, or, you know, vote for you, but I just don't think you're conservative enough, or I don't like the way you voted, and I think we need to true up the way that you vote for conservative principles are you it sounds facetious but like are you hearing that because in theory that's what this challenge is is that something that you hear day to day no not at all just the opposite right yeah i guess i'll I'll, uh process this by saying i i spend my time on um practical you know kind of nuts and bolts issues i don't spend my time on social issues are they important Certainly, they they have their place, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not putting my, all my time that I'm putting my time into tangible things that are gonna do, you know, that are gonna put food on the table for my constituents. And you aren't uh, hearing an outcry from them about them, is what you're saying. Pardon me. 
you're not hearing an outcry from constituents about these pop button no. issues that are being moved. No. I mean, there, there's a, there's a few loud, there's a few loud people out there, a, a vocal minority that do, um, but you know, uh, by and far, the the people I know, the people I grew up with, the people that you know, you know, knew me as a little kid, you know, they are they are thankful for what I'm doing, for what Dale uh, Patton and I are doing together uh, for our for our district, and uh, I don't hardly hear anything about uh, the social issues other than other than you know from uh, uh, from Facebook warriors. I uh, one thing that interests me about this is that. The assumption seems to be that that you should have signed the loyalty oath or what have you. And I, I know I know the Citizens Alliance sent them out. I guess maybe they didn't send them to you specifically. But what they've done in other states, for instance, in Idaho uh, back in twenty in the 2022 cycle, is it was Citizens Alliance again. They sent around like a loyalty oath saying, you know, pledge allegiance to our agenda. Uh, and if you don't, we're going to spend money trying to defeat you. And and I that that itself is that stuff is a red flag. I mean, I. I, you go up, you, you pledge your loyalty to us, or we're going to go after you. That's that's, that's bullying right there. And that's, well, I, it seems it seems almost un-American to me. Like I I don't think our elected officials. Like I can understand. Like you're a member of a political party, right? And a political party is organized around a set of ideas and is trying to elect like-minded people to various offices, and that's fine. Um, and, and even advocacy groups, you know, they have a position on taxes or guns or social issues or something and and they they're going to they're going to rate lawmakers and say this person does a really good job and this person doesn't do such a good job. I think that's fine. The idea to me is is I I mean you you should take one oath and that's the oath to the Con- US Constitution and the North Dakota Constitution and to faithfully serve you know the people in your 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 legislative district. Like that's that's who you're loyal to and this idea that there's some other organization that you should be loyal to I I mean, I have a problem even with the concept of it. I mean, whether you like Citizens Alliance or or not, or what what they're trying to do or not, I I just have a problem with the idea that North Dakota lawmakers should be swearing an oath or signing a, a an allegiance statement or to anything other than the laws of our country and our state and 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 just the your duty to serve the the people of North Dakota. Here are the oaths I took. My first oath I took at age seventeen when I enlisted in the in the, in the military. I took another oath when I got my commission as an officer in the army, and I took another oath when I came to the legislature. That's where you know I'm going. If I'm going to give my oath, if I'm going to give my word, it's going to dang well be something that is important, not not a not a flash the pan emotional issue or throwaway thing that you know, means nothing at the end. You know, when I give my oath, it means something significant so i don't give it very often but when i do it means something by the way representative olson's too humble to mention it he is a graduate of west point um which is a big deal in my book well thank you absolutely and representative olson can i ask you and for our listeners because i can't remember do you have democrats running in the general election in district 26 this year no we do not so june is our election so my follow-up was, I was going to speculate this, and I realized I should ask you directly. I don't quite see where Representative Pritchard nor his group um, view you as a target. I don't understand it myself. I also don't live out there, and I'm not in the Republican caucus. But do you feel this is simple opportunism where there are chances to swap out or bring Republicans closer to him, especially where there aren't challenges on the other side of the aisle at all in a district that, frankly, is very... Republican voting. Do you think this was just simple opportunism? Are you seeing this across the state? Are there discussions within the caucus about that? No, I'm never going to try to pretend I know what's in his heart or his mind. I honestly don't want to go there. Um, And I don't know what the motivation was for the other uh, candidate to come in other than what he had said to me privately. Uh, But I, and I don't know what his affiliation is with that, but was there talk in the caucus during session? You've been in there for the 2023 session. The Republican caucus meets, I think, on a weekly basis, on a regular enough basis. When you were there, was Representative Pritchard or other folks who identify with what they would consider their wing of the party, were they saying out loud, we think the caucus, we think folks aren't voting the right way, it's upsetting us? Was this voice to you? No, and a lot, we also had, like, fr- freshmen, you know, less freshmen means that they, they didn't show up. They were... Uh, uh, 
I guess Long 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 felt that they didn't, they knew what they needed. They knew enough. They didn't need to, uh, um, to learn anymore. Well, I, find, I found those sessions extremely um, helpful uh, to make me a better legislator. For behind the scenes for folks, and I'll speculate a little bit because it's a compliment to Mike before, mostly caucuses talk about what's happening on the floor that day and what bills are coming up that are hot button bills, see where like get a temperature and serve as, I assume, educational sessions. And I'm guessing Mike before brought in a whole lot of folks to talk about oil extraction, tax rates, what have you. You're saying that there were freshman legislators that frequently just didn't show up to caucus during session? Um, so, yeah, you know, something like that, but I'll, I'll, I'll break it out. We have, we had the caucus meetings and then we had freshman educator training meetings. So th- those are oh, okay. Those are separate, but they weren't showing up to those. Correct. When are you hearing, I mean, I, I mean, switching gears a little bit from the Citizens Alliance stuff, um, obviously you're running for re-election. Um, the election for your district's happening in June in the primary because the general election is going to be uncontested. Um, what what are you hearing from voters right now? What are they concerned about? What are their priorities? It could be a bunch of different things. Uh, in, our, in our area, in, in Western counties, uh, water is a big deal. Uh, having uh, having access to it, uh, cost of water, uh, roads, infrastructure is another is another one because I mean we are the ones that are we're pounding we're pounding our roads down you know uh, extracting this treasure for our, for our state uh, to, to a, a small extent the uh, property taxes and most people are getting are, are learning now that the that property tax uh, abolishment thing is 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 a really bad thing. And it's a really, really bad thing for our counties, you know, our district, because they would be backfilling it with oil and gas money. So getting that, that's a job is, has, has turned a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of opinion, you know, back to, you know, back to where, you know, we, it should be. You don't want the city commission in Arnegard to have to travel to Bismarck to approve a new street, to, um, street light. Absolutely not. Well, here's the thing, you know, you you think the western counties have enough uh, voters have enough uh, legislative votes uh, compared to Cass County or or Burley County to you know when it comes to that and it, here's the thing you know you're talking about the local control the state legislature meets once every two years so if you're going to try to get something for a project or and you get a uh oh happen you know you got to react fast you're not going to wait eighteen months to request money whereas the county commissioners meet at least twice a month city commission meets you know very frequently too they're the ones that can react on a short uh, in a short timeline this oh. well i I, w- I was gonna ask you know i w- one of the reasons i perceive one of the reasons why citizens alliance is, is targeting you is your vote on some of the social issue votes and, and you said that wasn't a high priority for you i mean you're not you said they're important i'll say that it, it's not a high priority for me to put a lot of time and effort into it i i vote conservatively sure but I'm not going to be, I'm not the champion of that. I, I guess I, I deal with the nuts and bolts stuff. I deal with the, the mechanical issues, not the social issue. That's my gift. That's my forte. The, the, the knock on you from that crowd that I've heard, the, maybe the citizens of the, or the, the faction of the Republican Party that Representative Pritchard's trying to represent is that, if I remember right, you voted against one, maybe both of the, the book ban bills. Um, do you want to talk about those votes or, or, or why you voted that way? On the, I'm sorry, the what bill? The uh, book ban bills. Um, or maybe I'm maybe I'm misremembering you. I believe I voted for one of them, the one that uh, okay. our uh, Lafore had put out. I voted for that one. Okay. Now that was a tough one for me. I mean, I, I was I was I was you know I was torn on that one. It was not an easy vote for me because there you know on one side you have. You you have the you, you have the, the the stuff from the school that shouldn't be there for kids or libraries that shouldn't be there for kids, but you know, the other side you got the you, know, you got the First Amendment. So I, I I think I voted on the lighter version of that. I absolutely voted against the one that had uh, uh, penalties for, for librarians and stuff like that. The thing is that we're coming down so heavily handed on that. I was like, no, this is this is garbage. You know. I, I can understand having a having a study, you know, having the ability to, okay, let's segregate them or, or something like that. I, but I was not a I was absolutely not a fan of 
have the state come down and heavily add it on on a, on a, on a library or a teacher. This is perhaps an unfair question to ask you, but you're in the middle of it now. You're you're a freshman and you didn't design it. You didn't design this, but I know in some surrounding states that are kind of one party control. So in Montana, South Dakota, Republicans are the dominant party the way they are in North Dakota. Statewide offices are held by Republicans, large majorities in the legislature. The governor is a Republican. In those states, there's been an organized effort in Montana. It's called the Business Solutions Caucus. And it's what it sounds like. It's essentially the Chamber of Commerce and frankly, not really MAGA aligned, not very so, not very online, not very social media based caucus that raises money for itself, does separate endorsements. At this point, with what I, you know, obviously I have my leanings, but what many would consider to be unserious legislation or unserious challenges that are focusing on things that just aren't part of everyday North Dakotans' lives. Do you think it's time that, that something like that happens in North Dakota where June becomes the real election to see which faction is going to control the party that truly controls Bismarck? Do you think that's something that needs to be proactively done within the caucus? Well, honestly, you know, again, I don't know the, the background on that, but you know, in, in uh, conceptually, uh, yeah, uh, because like, like you said it yourself, Ben, for many, many areas, you know, minus Grand Forks or Fargo, June is the election for probably 90% of what's going on in North Dakota. It's going to be a Republican. Get, the Republicans are going to be getting elected in November. I mean, that's it, it, it's not which, I mean, yes, wishful thinking, but it's also a statistical fact. So June is the is where the focus should be. And I, I, I agree. And we've been trying to put a lot of focus into the June primaries because that that is what's deciding um, what's going to happen. Yeah. June, okay, it's going to be a Republican in the fall, but okay, which Republican are you going to pick in June? I have a couple of like screener questions you could do. You could just start with like, do you know what a mill levy is? Do you know what WTI stands for? You better not tell me some social media thing. And then maybe like something else too, like some like oil rates, property taxes, whatever, something really boring. You have to pass the test. That's Ben's commentary that you'll, that they won't accept, <laughs> but. <laughs> S and S on everywhere. WT something else is, but you know, I don't. <laughs> yeah, that might that might that might stand for an internet. That might be an internet acronym that none of us want to touch. I don't know. Um, yeah, I essay question. What is the relevance of West Texas Intermediate to North Dakota's economy? <laughs> uh, and if you say, huh? Yeah, then kind of, out. <laughs> kind of kind of important. Um, J- Jeremy, how do we? Um, you 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 have always struck me since you first. Uh, you know, I you and I have talked off and on you know i've i've interviewed you for a story now and then um you have always struck me as a serious-minded lawmaker and indeed when we were talking about you know what's you know what are you hearing from voters and they're talking about things like well roads uh you know we're talking about you know wanting to keep local control we're talking about you know how do we handle our oil tax revenues you know because a not small chunk of them come from your legislative district so how do we refocus at times, and maybe maybe the media is to blame for some of this. Although it's hard, it's hard when we have these hot button issues, you know. With, and there's a lot of public interest in them, and you see, you know, dozens or, or or even sometimes hundreds of people lining up to testify in committee about some of these bills. It's hard for us to ignore it. But as as, as a policymaker who obviously believes that you know, listen, boring things like roads and taxes and stuff are are the, are the most important part of the job. How do you communicate that? To, the, to an electorate that sometimes I think has an interest in you guys being entertainers and not policymakers. Speaking for myself, I, you know, I can go a long way now. And I, and I just try to make that effort. And, I, and I'll ask the question is, it, it, what's more important? You're, you know, putting food on the table or, or what the, uh, What's going? You know, who uses what in the in what school? You know, and in, in their, invariably nine out of ten are going to say, you know, what are the, what are the bread and butter issues? And, that, and that's what, that's why I go on. People, I've, I've had the advantage, I've the blessing of being growing up here, so people know me growing up. They know what I've done. They, and I've been back here for about thirteen years. So, and I, the legislature isn't the first thing I've done. I've been on. Board, I've been flying zoning boards. I've been a township officer. I've been I've been doing all that stuff for a long time. So 
I've made a, you know, I've made my reputation as a serious, um, right. government, sir, uh, public servant. So it's not, you know, they don't expect me to be the entertainer. I mean, yeah, we have fun. We, have, we joke around, but you know, when it comes to these, uh, bread and butter issues, you know, they, they know where I'm at. And I, you know, same thing with Senator Patton. We are we're serious lawmakers. We, we focus on the, we focus on the things that are going to, at the end of the day, they're not sexy. They're not hot button issues, but they are the one, they are the things that are going to, you know, uh, you know, be the, you know, be, be, be the baseline, the bedrock of what our, our economy is going to be. Being from Fargo, I'm used to folks campaigning heavy in October, just seeing it, seeing the yard signs, seeing the door knockers, the ads, that kind of thing. And I'm not out there in Mackenzie County, so I don't know. Do you think the average voter who shows up in November but isn't paying attention to party mechanics and caucuses and that sort of thing, as you're talking to folks who you know vote but aren't like insider-y or just aren't super political, do they know about this race? Are you? Does it concern you at all? They go to the ballot in June to vote on city issues and see four Republicans or three Republicans on the House side, and they just are like, "Oh shoot, uh, I think I know Jeremy." I don't know. Is that? Are you worried about that? Uh, to some extent, yeah. But you know, that's why I'm wearing out wearing out shoes, going around knocking on doors, and and uh, getting out of my comfort zone and and and, and, and meeting people, and uh, just uh, I said. My, I gotta outwork the other guys. That's that's what it comes down to. Using my peer network, using my advocates to uh, spread the word. You know, that's that's the thing that's gonna do it. It's it's uh, it's not a, you know, it's it comes down to you know boots on the ground and, and do the hard work. Hey, if you if you know where the dogs are that bite by the end of June, you'll I think you'll be setting yourself up good. I already found one a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well. Uh... Uh, well, Jerry, I thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. All right, Rob, Ben, thank you. I uh, had a good time and uh, all the best. The cold cases you see at The Vault have captivated readers across our region for years. At The Vault Podcast, our team of professional reporters takes you further into those stories with new interviews from family members, investigators, and experts. Check out The Vault at inforum.com slash The Vault and subscribe to The Vault wherever you find your podcasts. Welcome back. Just finished up with Representative Jeremy Olson, um, who I, who by the way, I think is is a mommy. Mean, not that I agree with Representative Olson all the time. That's not the point. The point is he's a serious-minded lawmaker who is organizing his, his public service around public service and not entertainment. And maybe that's boring for listeners. Maybe it's, oh, this guy's just talking about roads and stuff all the time. That's what the legislature is supposed to be doing. They're not supposed to be like, you know, making you laugh on Facebook or delivering good memes and stuff. That's, they're not supposed to be influencers. They're just supposed to be public servants. That's it. And Representative Wilson, that's kind of the moment. That that's exactly the sort of person I want in elected office. And that's why I, I got into the district a little bit with him because for a while, Western North Dakota, the farthest Western strip that borders Montana, had basically three legislative districts in it. And this is getting into the weeds, but when you have this unprecedented oil boom happening, these huge, you know, 150, 200% population growth in Watford City, Dickinson, uh, Williston, and everywhere in between, um, not that the folks there who were representatives, who were state senators, were bad, and you had someone who were pretty high up like Rich Wardner, Senator from Dickinson, who's the majority leader in the Senate. Well, that's true. But most of the legislators were coming from Minot, Grand Forks, Bismarck, and Fargo, Fargo, West Fargo. And I'm glad post-census that they've got a more specific district around the Watford City area. And looking at someone like Representative Olson, I'd never met him before, but from how he's talking, what I've seen about him online, seems very focused on those growth issues, on that infrastructure issue. And if I'm a person living around Watford City that works in the energy industry or somewhere supporting it, and I see him out there talking about those sorts of things and not, I don't know, what's in a library every day of the week. To me, that's him doing his job. And I'm wondering if those folks know that when they're going out and voting in the June primary. I, I was happy to hear that he said he was wearing out a pair of shoes and he's taking this primary as if it was a general election, because I think there's going to be a lot of, especially Republicans now in the future in North Dakota, 
that really the race is June. You got to get out and huff it March, April, uh, May, June. When the snow's off the ground, that's your election. And that goes for voters too, by the way. I mean, voters need to understand you can't just, I mean, the way things are going in the North Dakota Republican Party, a lot of the competition is happening in June. If you wait around to really engage until the general election and voting in November, then you've missed the boat. I mean, by that time, at that time, it, it may be settled. I mean, by the time it gets to November, you may not have a choice. It's just going to be three people running for your legislative seats unopposed. So, and what's the and and we and we should actually look that up. Uh, that actually, be a good story. The precipitous drop from the November election versus the June election. I mean, it is double digits. You're looking at what is it? Roughly fifty percent turnout on a good year in November. You are looking at less than thirty percent in June. Almost well, sometimes, it's sometimes less. I mean, depending, and it, that varies obviously. But like statewide, yeah. I mean, it's there's just not Maybe. nearly as many people voting in June, which is why also it bothers me where we put. You know, we have an age limits ballot measure that's going to be voted on here in June that almost nobody's talking about. I think because everybody just assumes it's going to pass, and that will go on in June for sure. Oh, yeah. That's oh, yeah, submitted. That's, that's been submitted. Yep. The, the signatures verified. It's it's on the ballot in June, and almost nobody's talking about it. Um, and I, I mean, I think it's going to pass, and it's probably not. You know, it's whatever. It, I, I it's mean, it eighty. Does, it's eighty-one, right? You I can't think that's what it is. serve at the yeah. age eighty-one for federal office. Federal, Was it or, fact, the congressional delegation? And it's intended. I mean, the people behind it are the term limits people, and what they want is they want to create a vehicle for challenging the Supreme Court precedent set in nineteen ninety-five in U.S. term limits v. Thornton, which essentially the Supreme Court ruled that. States can't set pre pre prerequisites for serving in Congress because that's set out. And, and frankly, I think that's the right precedent. That's laid out. That's laid out in the United States Constitution. Um, and I don't. I don't want America to become a patchwork where you know California says that one of their you know one of their senators always has to be a woman or something like that. Like I don't. I, I don't want that to be a patchwork. If we're going to make a change to the prerequisites for serving in Congress, whether it's an age limit or anything else, then it ought to be the same for the whole country and it ought to be the same, it ought to be in the United States Constitution. But well, there, we already have a bit of a patchwork too. Look at Georgia and Louisiana. You can't win on plurality. You have yeah, to get 50%, so they keep having these December but it's a, it's that's, a, that's a little different in that, it, I mean, it's not like an well, it's a It's a different route to becoming sure. a state, a U.S. senator than Minnesota, yeah. North Dakota, Montana. That bothers me a lot less than, uh, you know, I agree. and we, and we, I agree do, you, and we do, and we do vary from state to state on how we like fill vacancies. You know, for instance, some states appoint, are. get appoint U.S. senators. North Dakota, um, the senator has to be elected. Um, you no, know, not anymore. Uh, or no, no, now the senator has to be elected, but they used to be gubernatorial appointments. Right. But well, there was, uh, there was, uh, the, there was, the Heidi Heitkamp uh, clause. Yeah. When Heidi Heitkamp was with, everybody thought she might run for governor again and then, and then appoint her own replacement. You know, they got out and. I don't really have a problem with, I mean, the appointments are, I, I like the idea of the person serving in, in the Senate being elected. I don't think that's, I mean, whatever the motivation. I, I like that. If you were going to do it though, much like the weird, the weirdly patchwork term limits thing, don't just apply it to one office because you're spooked by how I can't make it everything that. Well, the, well the, the only thing is if we're talking about the federal offices, the U.S. Constitution does say you cannot appoint members of the House of Representatives. So that would really, been, yeah. oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, right. yeah. People in the house have to be elected by the people. They cannot be appointed, which is why there's always special elections and not appointments when you see congressional. Um, you know, so that's so. So I mean, the Senate was the only place where the state of North Dakota could have made that change. Um, okay. Well, and, and, I think, and I think the only reason that it's allowed for the Senate is it used to be that the senators weren't even popularly elected; they were all appointed by the state government. Uh, they were until, appointed by the state legislature, right? Well, I think it varied from state to state, the appointment process. Oh but, but uh, yeah, that was the 17th Amendment made them popularly elected. And frankly, I think we got to go back to the old way. Um, I like that better. But you, you want the state legislature to select our senators. Yes. You yeah. can, we can I, have, I, I, we can have a whole you, debate about the 17th Amendment. I'll give you one year then. You can see if you regret that yeah. when you, whenever the state legislature picks who they want to pick. Hey, well, the legislature is elected of the people, and I'm also an advocate of the people getting what they voted for um, good and hard. That I, so one way of putting it, I was going to ask you, and I should have researched this beforehand, 
Rand Pritchard's group that's endorsing this challenger to folks like Representative Olson, do they have a published list of candidates they want you to vote for in the primary in June? They, well, they, they sent out a list of, yeah. I mean, they sent out some okay. emails, like fundraising how, lists. I wrote about them a while ago. How I mean, many people, how many challengers are on that list? Well, I don't, I don't, they didn't list the challengers. They listed basically the lawmakers they didn't like. And, and even those... Even those were duplicitous. Okay. So, okay. so they, they so they said, endorse the ant. They they have an anti list. Right. They don't necessarily have the pro list. Right. Um, Ugh, that's stinky. Yeah. Well, because I think I think they've I think they wanted to keep their challengers from being targeted or keep them under the radar a little bit. But they have. I, and if they and maybe they have put out a list somewhere and I just haven't seen it. Um. But I, I, I that's also my favorite keeping it a secret while running for public office because no one will find out that. Well, right. Well, oh, eventually people are going to find out, but maybe find out in a timeline where they can't necessarily mobilize yeah. against them. But yeah. the um the, the one thing is is Representative Pritchard sent out a a um as 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 executive director for Citizens United sent out this list of of dozens of um lawmakers who voted against uh it was one of the anti-trans bills and I'm forgetting which one. And they accused well, them, the social right, and, and they accused them all. They all voted against this bill, and what terrible people! The thing is, is that of the more than almost thirty lawmakers that that the 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 mailing targeted, almost all of them had voted for an identical bill. Like they voted against the duplicate bill, right? Which, as you know, as a former lawmaker, that happens. Like sometimes you end up with two bills that come through, and they do pretty much the same thing. So you kill one and you pass the other. 85 percent it also comes down to that really bs complaint and a uh, campaign attack ad tactic uh you could have said that al carlson and i voted the same way 90 percent of the time or 85 percent of the time because 85 percent of bills are procedural cleanup bills you all go by percentages are adjusting words not adjusting budgets and where you need to look is where the rub is and why they vote again or against the things they did but in the case that you're talking about yeah it's just it's basic bad faith narratives that are created by not intentionally not including context and it is deception via implication it's not an out and out lie because they vote against that bill but they're not giving you the surrounding context and it matters in fact a lot of times in lawmaking it's all that matters and it's it's extremely frustrating when it's yeah. coming from a lawmaker because he knows better so he knows that so, so so the bill was the, the the bill was the um the pronouns bill um, and, and there were two of them. One was Senate Bill 2231, and that failed. And then the other one was House Bill 1522. That passed and was signed into law by Governor Burgum. Um, now, Representative Pritchard's group um, named 24 House lawmakers and called them woke and spineless and everything else for voting against Senate Bill 20, 2231. All but, of those 24, all but six of them actually voted for House Bill 1522, which was an identical bill. So so even, and again, I wish both of those bills had failed. I don't think either of them were necessary. I think their providence was mean-spirited and, and for a lot of people, you know, rooted in, in bigotry. I mean, the bill basically banned schools from using the preferred pronouns of, of students. And I, I understand people get wrapped around the axle about some of that stuff. I just, I, I just feel like that could be handled more delicately and more respectfully at the school district. Yeah, locally. It's also the state bigfooting schools yeah. from having their own. Yeah, copy. I don't think there's anything conservative at all about that. But even even setting aside the objections that you and I have for that legislation, Representative Critchard's group accused 24 lawmakers, called them woke and spineless, when 18 of those lawmakers that he targeted and attacked had actually voted for an identical bill. Like if you if you read the two bills and if you go back and I mean uh, if you go back and, and read my column about it, I link to the full text of both bills. And here I'll, I will read you the bill numbers again if you don't believe me. Um, Senate Bill twenty two thirty one is the one that failed. House Bill fifteen twenty two is the one that passed. Go look them up and read the text. They're the exact same bill. And you tell me then how honest is it to attack somebody of voting against legislation when they when they actually voted for an identical bill. Because at that point, to your point, if you're in favor of this bill and in favor of what it does, this attack doesn't make any sense because like you're saying, they literally voted for it. And what I thought was very interesting was I brought up during session, the political parties have caucus, which are mostly informational sessions and like a you know heads up, this is coming up on the floor today. 
And during those times and after hours meetings, you can voice your, if you want to, you can voice your opinion that the party or your caucus isn't doing blank enough, should be doing this more, should be addressing that more. There were plenty of, when I was there, plenty of like this, you know, garrison diversion is being talked about enough. You're leaving us, you're leaving the Western section of the state out in the cold. We're not doing enough for the, take your pick, the law school uh, in Grand Forks because you guys didn't approve this budget, on and so forth, in both parties. And then to also hear that from representatives and hear that Dale Patton and others have reached out to Brandon Pritchard, reached out to these folks and asked, what's going on? You didn't talk to us, but you didn't say there was a problem before this. It's a small state, and it's an even smaller state of elected officials and people who are politically active out in the Capitol. At that point, if you're so passionate about this, aren't you running and hiding? And he's not responding to you about this. Brandon Pritchard isn't in this case, who's very much put himself as the figurehead. So what's your end goal here? If you're not willing to be out and talking about this in public, if you're not willing to say this to the face of the people who you're in a caucus with, what are you trying to drive towards here? This just feels like self-aggrandizement and there's not an actual issue at stake here. What he says is the problem isn't the problem. It just feels like he wants a caucus where he's the majority leader immediately. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that's the problem where, where Pritchard's the executive director of this group. And, you know, he sent around a pledge or whatever and, and wanted a bunch of the lawmakers to, you know, sign up for this pledge to support his group's agenda. And a- again, that's not I mean, how many times do you hear legislative leaders, you know, majority leader in the House and the Senate, and they will tell their members, I understand that some of you like this is what I think we ought to do, but I understand some of some variation on, you know, you have to represent your district. Like you have to vote. Like I understand. Like you're not going to vote with the rest of us because, yeah. you, you know, you come from a place in the state where, you know, you to serve the people best, you have to take a different sort of vote. Like th- there is a fundamental understanding that the first duty that you know, in this, I, any elected leader, but in this case specifically a lawmaker, their first duty is obviously to uphold the state constitution and uphold the the, the U.S. Constitution, but also and to pass serve. Budget. To serve your constituents and not just the constituents that voted for you either, but all of them. Well, the typical line from leaders, caucus leaders, which I think is correct, is vote your district, vote your conscience. Don't surprise me. Keep the lines of communication open. We're not going to agree on everything. In fact, it's absurd to think we're going to agree on everything. But don't get wrapped around the axle about it. Don't take it personal. It's fine. You're here to do what's so frustrating about the whole thing beyond the bad state, beyond the lack of communication, and and there is just straight-up opportunism there is. You're in a state where, because it's a smaller state, because you have less than 20,000 people in your district, because you can know the people in your district, the people can know you, you're in an open government, and you're in a state in a dynamic time in the energy industry, in the egg industry, going into precision, in prison, precision egg, our commodities, energy and agriculture, are powering and feeding the world, and we're becoming more and more integrated into the world's economy. And you look at that and you look at your ability to be an elected official, be part of that, be part of the promotion, be part of setting out regulatory framework, subsidies or otherwise to help foster this. Hopefully you agree on that goal. And what you want to do with all that is just do purity primaries to other people in your caucus. That's your ambition. It it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense and it doesn't have a lot to do with, with, again, Serving the state of North Dakota and serving the people of the state of North Dakota. So, um, hey, I want to switch gears and talk about, and I, I wrote a column about this shortly before we started recording, um, but there was a, I, I've been writing a lot about Doug Burgum's pursuit of the vice presidency. Yeah, what was the good way of transitioning? Like, speaking of New York courtroom trials, I was trying to think of something, but I did that. Yeah, there was no transition for this, but it's another thing that I think we should talk about a little bit. Um, I, I, I'm looking at, you know, obviously watching, I have not been impressed with, with, you know, what I've seen from Doug Burgum. I, I mean, showing up at Donald Trump's criminal trial to sit behind him, you know, as, as we're all listening to testimony about how he paid off a porn star. Right. And, and I'll, I'll acknowledge, like, I, I think that criminal case is dubious. I think it's a stretch. I'm not sure I would have brought the charges if I was the prosecutor. But what's been revealed on the stand under oath in a politi- in the political sphere is not flattering for Donald Trump. I mean, the fact that he 
He had sex with a porn star. He had an arrangement with a tabloid to, you know, basically search out stories that were negative for him and bury, you know, pay it basically to capture them and bury them. I mean, absolutely bizarre that that worked in the in the era of the online story too. I, I just, it's just bizarre. It's well, not ethical. Well, I mean, the thing, the thing that they did is he, I mean, he paid the national the national choir went out and paid large sums of money to stormy daniels and this is again this is based on the under oath testimony of the former publisher of the national choir the unfortunately named david pecker and and stormy daniels who received the payment and also michael cohen who was donald trump's attorney and facilitated the payments i mean these people are testifying again under oath under i'm I'm so ready to never hear the names stormy daniels about it but ever again I, i know but here we are and yep. whatever else you think of them, they testified under oath that this happened. Um, and, and so, I, I mean, those things are, those things happened. And, 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 and now Donald Trump, or excuse me, Doug Burgum is going to go stand behind Donald Trump after these things are being revealed for, about, about him. For half of a trial, they go have a press conference outside of the trial. Dressed like Donald Trump. I mean, did you see the picture where they're all dressed the same? As the worst barbershop quartet ever. Like yeah, it's the blue, the blue suit and the red tie. And it's it's. Uh, it looks like when you have a family of four boys and they're going to church for one of them to like get uh like when they're uh, to get their first communion and they're all dressed in the exact same suit and the exact same color and the exact same tie because it looks cute when you're under eighteen. Sure. Yeah, when your mom dresses you. Sure. Yeah, when um, your mom dresses you. I, I, I mean, looking at that, I, I, and I don't like the whole thing where. Where you see when Doug Burgum like does an ad- endorsement, like when he endorsed Tammy Miller and he used like Donald Trump's vernacular, it's like T- Tammy Miller has my total and complete endorsement, like like that. Or when he's endorsing the Republican candidate for the Senate in Wisconsin, and absolutely no one in Milwaukee was like, "Oh, well, I was yeah. going to vote for Tammy Baldwin, but now." But, but to me, it's 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 the dressing like him, it's the trying to sound like him. Um, it's I mean, you look at Christy Noem, who has remade herself had what the new york times described as a mega makeover to make herself had, look more i had such a i told you so with some other folks from south Dakota too. donald trump this week went on the record saying yeah that dog store was pretty rough but you I, know what we've all had bad weeks I, texted, like, I, I knew it wasn't a deal breaker when we were when we were talking on the podcast before and i think it was with chad and i you know i said i don't think you watch she's gonna get back in it she's gonna be back in the running uh, and, and the minute I saw that same headline you did, and I texted Chad immediately and said, "Yes, I told you." I, I said, "I said at the time, if anything, it shows she's going to be very unpopular and stay the course no matter what." And honestly, that could look pretty good to Trump when he's sizing her up versus Mike Pence. Yeah. So I, I but I just, I just, I, I don't like all of that, like the culty stuff where it's like we have to look like dear leader and we have to talk like dear leader. Or we have to look like the sort of woman that Dear Leader likes. I, I just, I think it's gross, and I think it's fundamentally un-American. But anyway, so so what we wanted to talk about though was was former mayor, former Fargo mayor John Lindgren's argument, and and his argument is that Doug Burgum is essentially engaged in a covert act of, I I don't know, it's civic magnanimity. Um, let me let me read in his own words. Uh, he, he wrote in his letter to the editor, I quote, I'd like to suggest the effort by Governor Doug Burgum to be a part of Trump's campaign may have embedded idealism. I'm a Democrat, but I've known Doug since he was a student at North Dakota State University and see his efforts to be on the Trump ticket differently than pundits who see it as only a self-serving ploy. He may see an opportunity to bring the Republican Party back to the powerhouse it was in another era. And so essentially what he's arguing is, is, is Burgum is trying, he's, he's playing the mega part so that he can get in and be a moderating influence on, on Donald Trump. Here's the deal. I think this is my take. I think I might agree. When I read John's letter, I was, it, it made sense to me because the way Burgum's tone and verbiage shifted when he was running for president, I felt like there was a spark in his eye that thought I was probably planned by a consultant, to be very honest, because a lot of them come up to you when you're things like governor and said, ah, oh, there's a way I could catch fire. I could do this. And when he flipped, it was a it was a new set of priorities. It was a new set of talking points. They weren't 
things he said before. And he was back at the Williston Petroleum Conference last week, but you've commented, and others have commented, he's kind of left the state behind. I mean, he's in Mar-a-Lago, he's in New York, he's out in whatever, wherever the rallies are for president. He's clearly part of this apprentice-style crew with uh, the senator from South Carolina and J.D. Vance and uh, Tim Scott. Tim Scott, J.D. Vance, Christy Nolan's probably circula- circulating up there. And they're all going to keep doing this, and Trump's going to see how long he can keep working them for. And he's sure. going to pick it. And he's making ratings. And he's got all right. these people out here there singing his praises and, and everything else. Well, by the way, Nikki Haley's still polling like 20% of the vote in um, at state primaries. So Very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. That's a whole other podcast. But so, sounds, sounds like a formula for a win if I'm Biden. Just just like hit up those, like, I know you're Republican, but like, come on. And you just get that like 3%, 5% yeah. of the vote in Pennsylvania, Michigan. So I have a I have a more nuanced argument or a new more nuanced response to Mr. Lindgren's argument. Um, I, I for one I don't dispute the fact that it's an act from Doug. Um, I I don't th- I mean you look at um, he he chose to run against Donald Trump in the primary. You don't do that if you want Donald Trump to be reelected president. Uh, he said on national television he wouldn't do business with Trump. And and I checked I checked with the Federal Election Commission this morning. Doug Burgum has never made a reportable political contribution to Donald Trump. He's contributed to Mitt Romney. He's contributed to Marco Rubio. He has never given a dime, a reportable dime to Donald Trump. So and I don't need to Ken Conrad, but we don't talk about that. Yeah. Well, um, but, but the thing is, is that the, I, I don't, I don't think the authenticity, I don't, I don't even think Donald Trump cares how authentic it is. He doesn't care why somebody's, you know, bending the knee and kissing the ring. He just cares that they do it. Um, oh, no, I'll go a step further. Donald Trump is stone stupid. He doesn't know that they're faking it. That guy is surface level. Oh, I don't, don't know. I don't, I don't think, no, I don't think he cares if they're faking it or not. I don't think he's that stupid either. I think that's a mistake people make about Donald Trump. He's not, a, whatever else you think about him, he's not a stupid person. Um, but, but, but back to Burgum, um, you know, it, what matters to me is not, I mean, obviously he's doing what he's doing. You know, the question is why? Lindgren, Lindgren's argument is that he's doing it so that, uh, you know, he can be sort of a moderating influence. Um, I don't think that matters. I, I I go back again to the Kurt Vonnegut quote that I'm so fond of, which is, you are who you pretend to be. And and by the way, that quote is from a book called Mother Night, and it's a novel about a man who served as a hugely successful propagandist for the Nazis during World War II, uh, who was also, in that capacity, serving as a spy for the allies and nobody knew about it. And in fact, after the war, uh, you know, the people who knew about it died and, and he has no way to prove that he actually did that. And, and the, the central question that the novel asks us is whether, you know, the good things he did outweighed the bad things he did in promoting Nazism. It's a really interesting book. Now, I, Nazism is not Nazism. I think that's a stupid comparison. But, uh, you know, the thing is, is I, the, the question for Doug Burgum is, is what he's doing you know, the bad things he's doing were sort of pandering to, you know, the the election conspiracy crowd and pandering to MAGAism. Is it outweighed by his potential moderating influence in 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 a Trump administration? And I would argue that it is not. In fact, what it makes me think of is that old Vietnam era quote where they said it became necessary to destroy the village in order to save it. Um, if you think that Donald Trump is a threat to an America is a threat to America then the thing to do is not to help Donald Trump get reelected. You know, the, the, the thing to do is to defeat Donald Trump or, or and, and, you know, defeat him in the primary, defeat him somewhere. I mean, I, don't, I, mean, I understand, oh, you're just going to support Joe Biden now. I kind of wish the Democrats had put somebody better than Joe Biden up against Donald Trump. It's like, it's like Republicans decided to pick the only candidate who could lose to Joe Biden and Democrats decided to try to pick the only candidate who could lose to Donald Trump. It's such a race to the bottom. But you said you wanted voters to get what they voted for good and hard. Yeah. Dan Crack primary voters well, vote for Joe Biden, sir. I know. Um, that one silver spoon, uh, uh, silver spoon is nobody, about congressman from Minnesota. It might have been, it might have been nice. It might have been nice that Democrats had put a real alternative to and not and not one of the weirdo little known alternatives, but an actual power. Yeah, Dean Phillips wasn't a weirdo, but nobody cared. Well, you know, he was a boring congressman from a Minneapolis suburb. I mean, okay. he, you know, but he, he, not I, a, I agree with. Hmm? I agree with your point, though, about if you fake it with this administration, what Donald Trump does, if you try and fake it till you make it, I think a more 
like I'm, um, I understand the comparison with Mother Night makes perfect sense. I think a more uh, American comparison could be a few of the the handful of Southern Democrats that would play footsie with, oh, now racists and would be using uh, racist segregationist language uh, in the 60s and 70s on the come up. And when they, uh, Jimmy Carter famously was on record saying he really regrets, he's like, I very much used dog whistle language in one of his races for governor against a Republican. And he didn't say, I don't like black people, but he said stuff that by implication meant we need them to stay out of our schools. Yeah. And he's like, I did it. And I feel incredibly guilty about that. Uh, and then you could argue, unfortunately, that him remaining governor via that was the pathway to him yeah. getting in the White House. And is that a good thing? I, you know, I know. And he, and, and to your point, Jimmy Carr doesn't think it's a good thing. He looks back and he's like, no, right. that sucks. I should have done I, that. I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I just don't know. I, I, I can't excel. I can't be like, I can't like sign off on what Doug Burgum's doing is okay because if he's the vice president, then he might be a Mike Pence, right? And be the guy who refuses to, refuses to overthrow the election because Donald Trump asked him to, right? I mean, that's, that's what you hope out of any public servant is that ultimately when, when the time comes that they put their oath to the constitution above whatever political loyalties they have. It's just, I, I, I'm just, I'm not ready to buy that that's what, that there's some hidden altruism to what Doug Burgum's doing. I think what Doug Burgum's doing is about Doug Burgum and Doug Burgum's quest for, for power and, and to get, move as high up the political ladder as he possibly can. I think it was silliness and I'm armchair quarterbacking now, but I think it was silliness that he had the numbers. He could have, he could have had a third term as governor of the state of North Dakota. If Biden had gotten reelected, you've been at the tail end of a two term democratic presidency his run for president in 2024 or that 2028 would have been pretty realistic. Now, again, that, that is me Monday morning quarterbacking him, but I, how long does this VP contest go for? When does Donald Trump have, have to choose? Is it, is it the key do it the day before the convention? And so I, I imagine, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I don't know. I'd have to look up the, t- I always forget what the timing is. I mean, obviously there's a ballot access question, right? I mean, whoever's running mate is, ha- he has to have a running mate to be on the ballot with him. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't know when the latest date is. So, I, I mean, it's, we have a little I'll bet, bet you, I'll bet you Donald Trump hangs them all out to dry until the day before he wants to dangle them and he wants to get ratings off of it, which right now he's actually failing to do because I, for the amount, whatever oxygen Donald Trump's getting, it's the trials. And even that people aren't paying that much attention to. Uh, they're not really, I, I just, I don't think the average person is saying, who is it going to be Tim Scott? Is it going to be J.D. Vance? I don't think nobody knows. I, I, I saw a quote actually from somebody at, around Trump. Um, and I actually thought this was really accurate. As he said, the only person who knows is Donald Trump and he even probably doesn't know yet. Um, so anybody who's saying that they know, they don't, they don't know. Um, here's my, here's my bet. And it's worth, uh, the amount of money I'm putting into it, which is nothing. Uh, I'll throw out, I think, I think they'll go with J.D. Vance. He'll say, this guy's got money, he's known, and he locks down Ohio. Great. Which makes sense to me. That, although that's a lot of logic. You can put it into Donald Trump's thing. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I am not going to tr- try to impose reason or logic on it at all. And I'm going to say he's going to pick Christy Nome. Um, if for no other reason than because there's nothing, there's nothing, you know, the, the sort of mega base likes more than somebody who is detested by the news media. And even though a lot of the mega base was also detested by Christy Nome, um, Pope Pope Trump has given her his blessing. He's uh, he's forgiven her her sins, and now you know she's she's in the position to be rehabilitated uh, and bring her back. The one thing I could see Trump being afraid of with Don, with Christy Nome is she might get more ratings than him, um, just because she's so much weirder. Yeah, you know what? You're kind of convincing me. You are kind of convincing me here. And I think they, the campaign really likes the idea of Nome versus Harris. I got so many text messages when I called that that Doug Burgum was going to show up at the trial. You would not believe because I mentioned it on the podcast. I said he's going to go there, like these other. Now you did you did call that nicely. Uh, and I I called it and I got so many text messages. So I'm I'm looking for if it's Christy Nome, I want more text messages from people saying Port, you called it again. Now if I'm wrong, and he picks Doug you Burgum or Katie Vance or something, I don't want to hear about it. But if I'm right. Feel free to shower me with praise. 
All right. Uh, everyone get their absentee ballot or figure out where you can vote before June 11th because yes. your primary is going to be very, 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 very. You great. can vote now. Like if you're afraid you're going to be busy on Election Day, there's nothing. You don't need to have a reason for it other than convenience. You can you can request your absentee ballot now. And, and by the way, I meant to mention this before, too, because uh, living in Cass County, there are 11 legislative districts here. There is not a single primary in Cass County, which is why I think this group with Pritchard is targeting people that don't have Democratic opponents in their race. That could be maybe that's me projecting more thought into it than they put into it. But there's plenty of rhino by their standards. There's plenty of rhinos roaming around the zoo here in Cass County that they could. Be- I just think I just think they couldn't. I mean, because their their argument is going to be let's go even more conservative, and I just don't know how that plays in some of these purple districts. Well, and shout out. Well, okay. Good job, Democrats. Up in like District Two, they have a full ticket. But Democrats, we gotta we gotta put somebody on a general election ballot in every one of these blessed districts, and we did it, and we did it for longer than most one state parties, one yeah. state party, quote unquote, used to do. We need to get back to it. I, it's and, hard. It's a hard pitch. And I will echo what you're saying as a conservative who is. I mean, no offense to our Democratic friends, but not that interested in seeing you guys get a majority. Uh, I would like to see you guys make Republicans work for it. Um, make them sweat and, a little bit. I mean, I think that and, would be, I think that would be healthy for this Republican majority. And it, and it's hard. You and I have talked about this because when you sit, it, it, that sounds great on paper. It sounds good to a lot of, a lot of Republicans I've talked to say, we need competition's healthy. We need it. When you sit down with somebody and say, okay, for six months, do you want to be knocking on doors, raising money, begging people you personally know for money, asking people to put science in the yard so you can get 35% of the ballot, and have a bunch of mailers calling you a communist, uh, to your neighbors. They go, uh, no. Yeah. No, I don't. I get it. I understand. Still, we live in a democracy. Still have to. It's, yep, uh, it's, still have it's, to. It's, it's part, of our, uh, part of our duty as a citizen. All right. We're going to we're gonna end it there. Uh, ben, thanks for sitting in. Absolutely. We'll be back next week with more Plain Talk. Thanks for listening. <laughs>